everyone. Welcome to the service today. Well, stand please and let's sing number 181 in our hymn. 181. Oh, how I love you. 
hands down. Let's stand this morning and say hello. Shake hands. Shake hands. seated this morning. We want to welcome you to Tri-State Baptist Temple, and we're excited about today. Uh, it's our vision day, and we've been talking about it now for several weeks and looking forward to it, and I'm just excited to see uh, the things we're going to get to see today, so we're looking forward to that. We do want to make a few announcements this morning, uh, remind you about just a few things. Uh, of course, our Kings Court uh, basketball program has been going on now and uh, we've been practicing each Saturday. Uh, next month, we'll begin our games, and so it's just been uh, good. We've had new people sign up uh, every week so far, and so it's been good. We're getting, uh, we've got a lot of participants now, and so be praying about that ministry as we uh, have uh, people in. We'll just be able to speak to them, uh, uh, build relationships, and uh, present the gospel to uh, people that might not otherwise hear it in another setting. And so we just are, are excited about that opportunity. Keep praying. Uh, about that, uh, so uh, but uh, just you can make note of some of the other things we have going on in our uh, bulletin. We want to uh, encourage you to be back tonight as well, uh, for as our vision day is all day long, be this morning and tonight, and so uh, our calendars will be available tonight as well. So those kind of things. So you just want to encourage you to be here and be a part of this great day. Uh, but this time we'll ask our men to come. We'll take up our tithes and offering and uh, faith promise this morning. Let's pray. Amen. Well, before Pastor comes this morning, we've got a group of men. They're going to come and sing a special for us. Come right ahead. Bye. 
your story, story of the Savior's love divine, love that brought him from the realms of glory, just to save a sinful soul like mine. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful, it is wonderful. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me. Boundless as the universe around me, reaching to the farthest soul away. Saving, keeping love it was that found me. That is why my heart can truly say, Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is, wonderful. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me. Love beyond our human comprehending. Love of God in Christ, how can it be? This will be my theme and never ending. Great redeeming love of Calvary. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is, wonderful. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me. Thank you, men. We appreciate the good song, and it is a blessing to be here today. We're thankful to see you, and we're uh, just excited. We got folks visiting with us today. If you're a visitor, we're so glad you're here, and we're thankful you're a part of our service this morning. And I tell you, I was praying uh, all evening, and boy, the Lord answered prayer, and uh, we were right in the no-snow zone last night. And so we're all here today. And that was a blessing. It's been a special day. We've had set aside for some time. We're looking forward to this morning, the message. Uh, we're going to reveal to you our theme for the year. And then tonight, a lot of other special things. If you looked at the radar last night, it looked like we were going to get pounded. Two to three inches of snow. A uh, huge big band of snow, two states high and a state wide, coming right across our area. And boy, I woke up this morning and nothing out there. So God's greater than the weather, isn't he? And so we're thankful for that and glad to be here. And thankful to you being here on our Vision Day in 2014. And uh, we're going to, throughout the day, just look ahead to the future at the vision the Lord has laid on our heart for our church, as well as recount a lot of the victories of the past and so it's an exciting day for us. Tonight, I hope everyone will be back in your place. Uh, we'll have set up over in this area a table, and if you uh, reserved a church calendar, uh, it'll be there along with several other pieces of material, and uh, those will be available for you to pick up at the end of the service tonight. I hope you'll just kind of let those set there till the end of the service, pick them up when our service is over. They'll be yours to take home and look through and look at. And they're filled with many, many of our activities, events, special meetings, special ministries, and all kinds of other things that we have scheduled in this year. There'll be other things that we are involved in as a church that aren't in that calendar, but we'll try to help you keep up to date with those as we uh, move along. But many of those things will be there. You can go ahead and look at it. I hope you'll use it as a tool for your family as you look forward to the new year in scheduling your vacation times and things around the activities and events of your church so you can be a part of all these things. And uh, so that'll be a great tool and resource for it. In that calendar, you'll find a, a, a each day of the a week, all 365 days, have a verse of scripture, a passage of scripture you can turn to. And so if you'll go back and catch up here in January, you can read through the whole Bible in a year. Many people have never done that. And I'd encourage you to read through God's word cover to cover. That'll give you a guide and a plan and able, being able to do that. And so that calendar will be yours uh, tonight at the end of the services. Uh, tonight will be a little different. We're going to take uh, uh, the bulk of the service and with the help of some uh, video slides and some special 
special short video testimonies. We're going to just go through and cast a vision and try to, uh, try to share that with you uh, for the ministries of our church. Uh, we're going to look at the clear definition of the purpose of our church and how that relates to all we are and do. Uh, we're going to look at many new things that uh, the Lord is leading us to uh, use as tools and resources for our church to be connected and be informed together and uh, to be able to, uh, to, uh, to serve the Lord. And so we're excited about all these things. And so I hope you'll be back tonight and, and uh, just be a part of what uh, God is doing uh, here at Tri-State Baptist Temple. This morning, I'd love for you to take your Bibles. And uh, this message this morning is kind of in two halves. And uh, the first part is an introduction. And then uh, we're going to pray. And then we're going to get into the bulk of the message. And in the message and in our text today... We're going to reveal our theme for the year and how we as a church, our lives as individuals, our family, our church uh, are, are, are uh, related in, tied to this key passage of Scripture and thought. And uh, so we'll look at it here this morning. But turn in your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. And we're going to read this passage of Scripture here. Uh, in just a couple moments together, uh, but I am thankful you're here. Again, we want to encourage everyone to be back tonight as we begin to discuss the vision and theme for our church here in 2014. Sunday night services are very important. Uh, they're important services, uh, as each service is. You know, each service in a church is unique and different. There will be things the Lord leads us to preach about, text to preach from, thoughts that we want to share in Sunday morning services that we'll not do any other time on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night because God has them uniquely planned and prepared for the group of people who will be here on a Sunday morning. But a Sunday night crowd is different, isn't it? It's different. And, uh, and, and on Sunday nights, the Lord leads pastors to often deal with subjects, texts, scriptures, uh, things that... Uh, that are different than he would on a Sunday morning. And in fact, often there are things that are going to uh, be more uh, intimately uh, linked to you as an individual, your family, our church, uh, things that will strengthen and help us uh, through the Word of God that uh, we're not uh, led of the Lord to or even at liberty sometimes to talk about on a Sunday morning. And so Sunday night's an important service in the week, and I hope you'll not miss it. I'm, I'm praying that many of you will step up and into those Sunday night services and allow the Lord to strengthen your life and family through His Word. Uh, tonight is the perfect night to begin, because tonight, uh, again, we're going to uh, let you know right from the very beginning some of the things our church is going to be doing in 2014. And, and ways that your family can be involved in those things. And so tonight's a great night to begin. We also always encourage people to begin uh, to uh, attend this year Wednesday evening services. And uh, Wednesday night's a great night just to be connected with families and stay informed about what's happening. And uh, we always say it's the most encouraging service of the week in our church all through the week uh, because you've already had to go to work. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the things of the, uh, of the week are, are, are on you. And uh, it's good to come in on a Wednesday night and get some encouragement. Be strengthened and fellowship together to face the remaining part of that week. And so it's an important week uh, service in our week as well. But uh, this morning, I want you to look into 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And uh, if you will, just follow along with me as I read through. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to take the liberty to... Uh, to do something, and I do not think it gives any uh, uh, disrespect to God's Word. But I hope you'll notice in this uh, repeated several times, you'll find the word charity. And it is the biblical word for love. And I'm going to use the word love. I don't think I do any disrespect to the Bible by doing that. I'm not trying to rewrite it. I'm just simply stating it that way. But uh, I hope you'll follow along with us. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. The Bible said, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy 
and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love, charity, suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Verse 8 says, charity or love never faileth. Never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly. But then, face to face, now I know in part. But then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope. Charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity or love. Now, in those 13 verses of Scripture, that word charity for love appears eight times. That has some significance, doesn't it, when a word is so often repeated as it is? It's a word, it's a word, this word charity, that was not even in the classical Greek language that the New Testament was written in. The Word of God is inspired of God. It was chosen, uh, God chose the time in which the New Testament Scriptures would be given to men. He chose the language in which they would originally be written down and recorded in. He knew the richness and the depth of the Greek language. And yet, even in that language, the word that this word charity, the love that it represented, was not even a part of their language. They had to create a word uh, that would reflect what this truth was trying to convey. Uh, it was a word uh, that was not present in the world among men or among men themselves. This kind of word, this kind of love that was represented by the word charity. It is a word that you're probably familiar with. The Greek word is the word agape. You've heard of that word, haven't you? The Greeks had to create this word to begin to describe the kind of love that was being portrayed or conveyed by this thought. This word agape means the love with which God loves. It's, it's the word that describes God-like love. God's love is described by this word agape. And we see it over and over and over here again in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It is a benevolent love. And sometimes we think about love being benevolent. In other words, we want to do for people uh, you know, what pleases them uh, because we love them. We, do, we have that kind of love for our children. We want to do for them because we know it pleases We want to do things for them they don't even deserve. Because we love them and we show that, demonstrate the love, a benevolent love. But, but this love that's described here, this agape, God-like love, it's not a love shown by doing for or giving to what the object of our love desires. It's not, it's not a love where we find out what the person we love wants and we get it for them. It's not that kind of a love, but rather it's a love that does and gives what the one who does the loving sees and knows is needed by the one who is loved. Now that's almost a little bit backwards, isn't it, from the way we think about love. 
when we love somebody, we want to find out what they want most in the world and get it for them because we love them. That's the way we do it, isn't it? But this kind of love, this God-like love, is a love that the person who's doing the loving gives what the person loved, not necessarily wants or even knows they need, but what that person doing the love knows that individual needs the most. And giving that to them, providing that for them. God's love, then, is a selfless, sacrificial love. Uh, It's giving and doing by grace what was needed in the lives of, and the souls of fallen men. The, the pinnacle verse illustrating this kind of love would be John 3.16. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Men, men did not look for the Savior. They did not ask for Him. They did not even want Him. They rejected Him. And yet God in His love for man, man being the object of His love, gave to man the greatest thing man could ever have given to them whether they realized it or not. He gave His only Son. He gave Himself. That's the kind of love this word describes. In John 15 and verse number 13, God explains for us the greatest ability man has within himself to love. And if you read John 15, 13, the Bible says this, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's the greatest capacity of love that a man has within his own nature to lay down his life for that which he loves. there's, there's, There's people all around the world today, men, whether they're Christian men or not, saved men or not, who wouldn't hesitate to lay down their life for his wife, for his children. Man has within himself that capacity to love one another. That's the greatest capacity man has to love among himself within himself, but the love of God is far greater than that. Because in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, God describes His kind of love. This love, this agape love of 1 Corinthians 13, where the Bible said, but God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, God didn't lay down His life for His friends He laid down His life for His enemies. He did not lay down His life for those who loved Him. He laid down His life for those who hated, reviled, and rejected Him. He loved us. We love Him because He first loved us. This is the kind of love that's described in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. In our text today, the Holy Spirit is using Paul as a penman And he's writing to explain to the Corinthians the importance of having God-like love in their life, in their church. That's what he's doing. It is, in fact, this love, God-like love, that that is being instructed here, uh, that, that it's the most important thing that could be experienced and demonstrated in the heart and life of God's people or in the body of the local church. That that love, God's love, is at the top of the most essential things that are necessary. And he begins by proving it in this text. In 1 Corinthians 13, he proves that love, God's love, is more important than anything else. And he does it very simply. Look back there, if you will, in 1 Corinthians 13. And he talks here about how much more important love is than the possession of great gifts. If you look at verse number 1, look at what it says. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Now, he's talking about here maybe people having the great gift of communication. This word tongues, it's a word here that means being able to communicate in other languages. We know that was the original 
gift of tongues in the scripture was the ability for a person like me who only knows English to go to a foreign country in the world and through the gift and the power of the Holy Spirit be able to communicate the gospel to them in their own language so they could hear and understand. That was the gift of tongues. It was not an unknown language. It was known by someone who spoke that same language. And, uh, and that was the gift of tongues. It was for the evangelism of the world uh, uh, and uh, for the souls of men. But think about what a great gift that was. And then he talks about here, uh, he says, uh, without though having love, without God-like love being present and being the motive behind communication, he said, it is in fact like a discordant or, or, or a horrible noise without love. He said, if, if you possess that great gift, but don't have the love of God using it and motivating you to use it, you become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. It's not a pleasant thing. It's a discordant thing. Uh, you, 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 you all, some of you all maybe have different types of wind chimes and things, uh, these types of things that make noise. There's sometimes, you have to be honest, it's not a really pleasant sound. It can be a very unnerving noise to hear all of those different notes being played all out of order and everything. God said you might have the great gift of communicating, even being able to speak in another language, but without the love of God behind it all, it is not a pleasing thing, it's a displeasing thing. He goes on to talk about the gift of communication in the area of prophecy. He says there, if you look in that uh, verse 2, second verse, and though I had the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and have all knowledge. Now, in the time this was written, the New Testament was not complete. And at that time, there was still those with the ability to see and comprehend divine truths that were not yet set down and recorded in the Word of God. And God gave them understanding to know the truths of God and, and to understand these things and comprehend them. But the Bible said even comprehending divine truths was not truly evidence that you had a divine life within you. You remember what the Lord said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, when He said, There'll be a time when many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not what? prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name have done many wonderful works and then the Lord said will I profess unto them I never knew you depart from me ye that work iniquity the Bible's telling us here that God-like love is more to be desired in our lives for our lives and in our church than even the great gifts of communication even the great gifts of comprehension in that second verse, the gift of, he goes on to say, of understanding mysteries and knowledge. Here, here, here are things that have to do with hidden secrets, understood mysteries, uh, being able to grasp scriptures, having the knowledge of God's word, its deeper meanings, its parables and types, being able to understand and comprehend these things. The Bible said, having all of that and yet not being grasped by or being able to grasp the love of God, he said it's all meaningless. It's meaningless. The gifts of communication or the gifts of comprehension without the love of God are, are worthless. He said, or, or even the great gift of having confidence. Look in that second verse at what it says, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I have nothing. He's talking, about, he's talking about faith, but he's not talking about saving faith. You know what kind of faith he's talking about? He's talking about miracle working faith. He's talking about faith that moves mountains, literally. He said, you know what? Uh, this, uh, uh, this kind of faith, it's not greater more, or, or more important than or more essential to a child of God or a church than having the love of God. Even having that kind of faith. Great gifts are no replacement for God's love in our lives or in a church. Neither is great goodness. 
Man is capable of some good things as we think about good things being, even though the reality of the matter is there's no good thing in us apart from Jesus Christ. But you think about goodness uh, being expressed, the great gifts of human goodness, the Bible says here in 1 Corinthians 13, are nothing without God-like love. In verse number 3, he talks about the compassion that man could have. And though I bestow all my goods, he says, to feed the poor. He's talking about... He's talking about giving, but giving without God-like love. You know, the epitome of this is systems where aid is given out, doled out, uh, according to a sense of duty or of a social philosophy. We see that in our own government and system. This system of giving out, giving out, giving out. We feel some sense of duty behind it. We, we have a philosophy of doing these kind of things. But you know, this kind of giving, it often satisfies the giver by making them feel good about themselves. And uh, it is instead uh, of selfless and sacrificial, it really becomes selfish and self-serving. Even these good kinds of giving. Uh, Great goodness, that which humans are capable of within themselves. It's no substitute for God's love. Even great gifts of compassion, nor, nor even gifts of compulsion. If you look at the latter part of that, of that third verse, he goes on to say, Though I bestow all my goods and feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. He's talking about the compulsive acts that an individual might do. Uh, you know, uh, this means giving yourself to become a martyr for a cause. Being so committed uh, to an ideal that you'd be willing to even die for that ideal. Uh, throughout human history, millions of people have become human sacrifices for something they felt strongly about, for a philosophy or for an idea. Uh, I can remember seeing people sitting down in the middle of the street pouring gasoline on themselves and lighting themselves on fire because they believed so strongly in some cause, starving themselves to death because they wanted to stand against something and prove a point. Uh, this is what this is talking about. But, you know, uh, these things may be motivated by politics or religion or social uh, ideas or philosophies. Some of these things may be good. Some of them, though, may essentially be bad. You think about how Islam has bloodied the soils of their world with their unholy resolves and causes and are willing to die for the things they believe in. Even those things are wrong. Even those things are in error. But even the Bible says the gifts of compulsive acts, they profit nothing if they're not motivated and enacted with a sincere, true, God-like love. Well, let's think about what, what what God is trying to help the Corinthians to realize here that greater than the greatest possessions and greater than their greatest expressions that man is capable of, greater than all of these things is the love of God. Greater than all of them is God-like love. And it is the greatest need for the lives of men in the lives of men, in and through the local church as it attempts to serve God and further His work in the world. God's love is the most important thing. You may have read the book, The Hiding Place. And if you've never read that, I hope you'll write this down, The Hiding Place. The author was Corey Ten Boom. That's three words. Corey, the word ten, T-E-N, and the last name is Boom, B-O-O-M. She was a young girl with her family growing up in Amsterdam in the Netherlands during World War II. The hiding place is the true story of how their father built in the attic of their upstairs bedroom a hiding place and they would hide Jews there who were trying to escape the Nazi destruction of the Jews. And for several uh, years into the war, they successfully were able to do that, being a part of the Dutch underground. One night, the Nazis came and discovered the room <clears throat> where they had, at that time, six Jews hiding. And they were caring for them and feeding them and taking care of them, waiting to get them out. And, and the Nazis arrested Corey Ten Boom, her mother, father, brother, sister, her whole family. She and her sister 
were both placed in the same concentration camp. It was a brutal, brutal place. They starved them. They tortured them. They did horrible, unspeakable things to the women in those concentration camps. Corey Ten Boom's sister grew steadily weaker and weaker until eventually she died in that prison camp. But before she died, uh, she, she spoke to Corey about the assurance and faith she had in her God. And she said this, one of the last things she said was, there is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. And she said, I am in that place before she went to go to be with the Lord. Corey Ten Boom saw that happen to her sister. She endured unthinkable things. Later on, she discovered after the war, uh, after she was released, she was released from the prison camp, she found out after the war that it was a clerical error that allowed her to be released. She shouldn't have been released, but a clerical error released her after the death of her sister. Ask about that. She said, God does not have problems Only plans. It wasn't a problem for God to have me release from that concentration camp. It was just a part of God's plan. Uh, After the war, she wrote that book, The Hiding Place. The story of her family, of her faith in God, which made her, after it became public, an internationally recognized Christian. She attended meetings and conferences all around the world sharing her story. One day at a meeting where she was to speak, she met a man who had been a guard in the Nazi concentration camp where she and her sister were held and where her sister had died a slow and cruel and agonizing death. One day there in that meeting, she met him face to face. He had, he had come to know Christ. He had confessed Christ as his Savior And he had come there to hear her after the war, after these things were over, hear her speak and tell her story. And when she met him face to face and recognized him, she said that all the horrors of that camp rose up like ghostly specters. And when the man asked her to forgive him, she said, all of my human nature revolted at the very idea of forgiving him. But she wrote, but I did forgive him. She said, I forgave him for Christ's sake. She said, I forgave him because of the love that God had shown unto me. She said, it was only possible because of God's love that I could forgive him. You know what? It was a miracle that only God's love could do. Only God's love could do that. When you read in Galatians chapter 5 about the fruits of the Holy Spirit, about being controlled by the Holy Spirit, these fruits are the characteristics of the person, the life, the nature of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. These seven things describe Him. And when you read that, you read first of all in Galatians 5, beginning in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, and it lists them, but the fruit of the Spirit. And by the way, when you read lists of things in God's Word, God places them there in a very specific order. Orders of importance. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit is, what's first? Love. God-like love. The love of God. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And by the way, that next part says, against these things there is no law. In other words, when these things come into play, when these things are put on the table, there is no law that can overrule them or stop them. They are powerful in their in what they are able to achieve. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And if we live in the Spirit, he says, let us also walk in the Spirit. In other words, let that love of God be a part of our life, permeating our life along with those other fruits. Henry Drummond was a Scottish evangelist. He was the author of a book I have in my library called The Greatest Thing in the World. You ought to get a copy of it and read it. He said this, you can take nothing greater into the heathen of the world than the impress and reflection of the love of God upon your own character. 
He goes on to say that this is the universal language. He said you could take years to speak Chinese or the dialects of India, but the day you land in a foreign country, the language of love understood by all will pour forth in an unconscious eloquence. It is the man who is the missionary, not his words, his character, not his message. He said, writing of his experiences within the deepest part of Africa, he said, in the heart of Africa, among the Great Lakes, I've come across men and women who remember the only white man they ever saw in their life, whose name was David Livingstone. And as you cross his footsteps on the dark continent, men's faces light up as they speak of the kind doctor who passed there years ago. They could not understand him, but they felt the love that beat within his heart for them. In our text today in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when we come down to verse 8, I hope you'll look at it and mark these things in your Bible. The Word of God simply states it like this, Love never fails. Love never fails. God's love never fails. And that means simply to me, love works. When all else fails, love. God's love works. Amen. It works when it's brought to bear upon the hearts and lives of men. When the greatest of possessions are not enough, when the greatest expressions human possibly uh, possible fail, God's love works. And that's simply our theme for the year of 2014. Love works. It works. It's what works in our heart and life. Love works. And we know that it's been demonstrated time out and time again that love works in our heart and life. As we move forward in this year as individuals, as families, and as a church, we want to explore and see how important that in whatever we do, we must do it with the love of God. The love that He has for us. And that in the end, love will work when every other effort will fail. The love of God will get the job done. Love works. Now, we're going to pray together. I hope this introduction, you'll just let it settle. But then we're going to take a few moments. I want to give you just three practical things about love. And we'll finish up here this morning. But let's pray together. Father, we are thankful people that as we look to your word today, God, we come together thanking you for the love that you have bestowed upon our heart and life. God, without the love of God, we would be nothing. We would be, we, we would be without hope. We would be separated from you. We would be, we'd be forever, Lord, condemned to a Christless eternity in the lake of fire. But thank you, God, for your love. And Lord, uh, we see in the scripture today that uh, all other things fail and can and will fail, but your love never fails. Your love works. Lord, when we think about uh, a lo the lost in this world, the thing that will make the difference in their life is when they realize you love them. And God, it'll work and do the job in their heart and life. And Lord, when we think about those tonight, uh, today, who uh, maybe have drifted away, and Lord, uh, their life and testimony have been shipwrecked, and Lord, maybe they truly know you as their Savior, but today they're, uh, they're far away from where they ought to be. God, it'll be your love for them, long-suffering to usward, that will, that will overcome and give them victory. And Lord, it'll work in their lives to bring them back to where they need to be. Lord, we just pray today that as a individuals, as a church, as family, that God will have a vision this coming year that in all we are, in our lives, through our lives, in our church, through our church, the love that you have, God, your love, God, will be uh, what gets the job done. And we realize, Lord, it will work as we, Lord, allow your love to be lived through our hearts and experienced by others uh, all around us. And we pray now as we just take a few more moments to consider some of these truths.
that, Lord, this coming year, uh, God, will see time and time again how your love works and gets the job done when all else fails. And so, Lord, we're thanking you now for what you're going to do. And we ask, God, that your love would be, Lord, comprehended in our hearts and lives and that, Lord, we'll be able, uh, Lord, to live daily uh, in that love and let it live through us uh, to impact and touch the lives of others. We ask it all today in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll take just a few moments. I want you to think as we move forward into a new year now with this theme of love works, love gets the job done, God's love will never fail. I want you to think as we move forward now how important it is uh, to, uh, to have that vision for our lives and church, but be sure that we always have a biblical view of these things. When we think about our church and moving forward and making plans and praying for the uh, church and the ministries of this year, I, I want to stay biblically grounded. You know, a New Testament local church is a body of born-again believers. That's what a church is. It's not the building, it's the believers that have joined together, uh, having followed the Lord in believers' baptism. And by the way, if you're here this morning and you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you've been born again you need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. That's the second great step in growth. First great step in growth, really, in your life is following the Lord in believer's baptism. Identifying publicly with Jesus Christ. Uh, baptism doesn't save you. It's a testimony of salvation that's already taken place. The Christ that now lives in you, uh, you're identifying with publicly and letting the, law, the world know that now you want to live for Him and serve Him. You ought to follow the Lord of believers' baptism. But the local church is made up of born-again, baptized believers, uh, folks who have been called out, called together, united with one heart and mind, uh, voluntarily joining together uh, to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ in this world, uh, to, to, to yield our lives to Him and allow Him to live through us. That's what the body of a local church is. Uh, we're commanded as a church body to carry out His work in this world. We're to glorify Him. We're to see men and women, boys and girls, uh, brought under a personal revelation, realization of their own sin. That, that they ultimately uh, receive Christ and, and the forgiveness of sin and salvation and then begin to learn how to follow the Lord and live for God with their own lives. You know, in this world we live in today, uh, it's ever more increasingly difficult to find the reality of a vibrant, real Christian life. It's hard to find. And, 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 it's, and it's hard to find a, a, a local church that's fulfilling God's plan, that's, that's, that's fulfilling the purpose for them in their community and world in a scriptural way that's pleasing unto the Lord. And the world needs and must have those things desperately. Uh, genuine Christianity in the lives of people. Uh, healthy, holy, scriptural churches. These things are needed desperately in the world in which we live today. And you know, there's no hope or truth anywhere else in the world but that which has been given to the local church. It's emphasized, we emphasized it some last year. If you have an old bulletin, the front cover would have said the pillar and ground of the truth. Speaking about the local church, 1 Timothy 3.15 says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. It is light, the church, in darkness. If we do not see truth in the church and light in the lives of God's people, then where else in the world are we going to find it if it's not there? Not only do lost men need God's people to be what God intends for us to be and the church to be what God plans for it to be, but for our Savior's sake, the Lord Jesus deserves that His churches be holy and healthy, furthering His work in the world. And He deserves being glorified. God's people living genuine, powerful Christian lives impacting the world, glorifying Him. These are the things He's worthy and deserving of. You know, when we get saved by the grace of God, we ought to realize uh, that we've been saved with a purpose. At the moment we're saved, we begin to realize God's purpose and plan for our life in relationship to His plan and purpose in the world, that we're a part of that. 
Uh, we ought to understand our Lord's example uh, of glorifying Him and laying down our lives to serve uh, the Lord and to serve others. In 2014, a great need for God's people is to realize that above all else, we are servants of the Lord and that our life is linked with this truth as we move forward in the year. Not only should we realize we're saved with a purpose, but at the center of all we are and do is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That will be the core of it all, the center of it all. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, go and read those first four verses. Christ's sinless life, His sacrificial, substitutional death and burial, the sovereign resurrection of Christ, the victories that He's won. This is at the core of everything we are in our own lives and everything we are as a church. This, this sharing, this focus of uplifting Christ and sharing the gospel. And then, you know, when we're saved, uh, we ought to realize that there's going to be some suffering involved in serving the Lord. It's not the New Testament gospel. Listen, it's not the New Testament gospel to preach that there are no problems, no pain, and no trials in the Christian life. If that's what you're listening to, you need to turn the channel because they're not preaching in the Bible. Because the Bible never teaches that. That is not the doctrine of the New Testament church. Uh, we find out that there's many adversaries. There are many enemies. There are many trials that we're going to face. Uh, sufferings that we can suffer in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. There are enemies of the gospel of Christ. There's hurt and disappointment in serving the Lord. These things are going to be true. Is it possible for the Lord's people in the world uh, to, to live according to His plan, uh, for His church to do what He purposed for it to do. Uh, if it can happen, how can it happen? With what and through what power and what motive can it be done? Well, the power of and the motivation is going to be the love that God has. His love. Because that's what never fails. That's what will get the job done. The love of God for us, through us, and the love of God we have for God Himself. That love, God's love, never fails anywhere, anytime, with anyone. Love will work. And that's what our focus has to be on in this year. I just want to give you these three simple things. I want you to think about the person of love. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, and the Bible said, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. The person of love. God is love. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. God is love. The, the Lord Jesus is God, and the Lord Jesus is, is love. They are love. Uh, it's expressed in His life. When you think about the Lord's life in this world, I thought about John chapter 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord, it said, is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Acts 10 verse 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. You think about his life in this world, and the things that he did, the many good things that he did. Listen, those two verses of Scripture read like the ministries, outreaches, and projects that a true New Testament local church ought to be involved in. That was what the Lord lived for as he made his way to the cross. But you know the reason these things were effective was because he did them with the love of God because he is love. And, and, you know, we can do a lot of things and plan a lot of things, but unless we do them with the love of God, they're not going to be effective. But with the love of God, they can't fail. They cannot fail. The person of love. You know, he did good, but he did it with the love of God. That was his purpose all through life. He gave his time. He gave his treasure what little he had in this world, he gave all that he had. And love was the guiding factor for how he utilized everything that he had. You know, he went through trials. And love was his source of strength. 
what sustained him and constrained him until finally he was nailed to the cross was the love that he had for you and I. Through all the trials, through the giving of his time and treasures, in his triumphs, when he rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave, love was the cause of it and the source that helped him to overcome all of those enemies was His love that He had for you and I. In our lives, we must allow the person of love to have our lives and live His life through us. You know, in good times, we can't forget, we owe everything to Him and our lives are His. Even in good times. James chapter 1 and verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variables, variableness, neither shadow of turning. Every good thing we've ever experienced in our soul, upon our family, uh, in our children, uh, in, in a financial way, whatever it is, all of our growth in the Lord spiritually, all of it has been because God loves us. Every bit of it. And even times when things are rough, difficult times, God loves us and He gives us grace to get us through those times and to grow us and to help us. He is the person of love. And He lives within our life. Think about the power of love. If you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we we'll begin with the seventh verse, which is my life verse. That's that one unique verse of Scripture that... God has laid upon my heart to be a verse that I never want to let very far out of my consciousness. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in that 7th verse, it says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak knowing that He which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up also uh, us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are, not, which, are, uh, which are not seen are eternal. When we look at this passage of Scripture, God helps us to see what the power of love is, what love, the love of God for our life, love Christ living within us will do for us. The power of God's love is known and can be known in every aspect of our life. When our lives are given to the Lord, you know, His love, His presence will be sufficient to see us through, to make us successfully live our lives for the Lord and be able to glorify Him. His life within us is the treasure that's within the vessels of our life. In verse number 16, he talks about two aspects of life. He says, he speaks there about our outward man and our inward man. And he talks about how the love of God, the power of the love of God, is able to provide for both the outward and the inward. When we look at this, when we talk about the outward man, he's talking about uh, our life as it relates to physically, and our relationship to this world that we live in, the outward man. Uh, the inward man has reference to our relationship to the spiritual things of God and to eternity. The outward man physically, the Bible said, is perishing. Our outward man perishing. Uh, he's, talking about, he's talking about the reality we all know. We're not as young as we used to be. 
We see it. We feel it. We realize it. We recognize it. We know it. We know that, that we're not what we used to be, even though we may think we are. Even though we may think we can do what we used to do. And maybe we can, but we can't do it as long as we used to do it or as we used to do it. Age, it creeps up on us, doesn't it? And uh, it begins to take its toll. Diseases of the body begin to afflict us. And you know, sometimes if we're not careful, if we forget about the resource and the power of the life of the Lord and the love of the Lord within our life, as we age and move farther down the road and our outward man begins that perishing process, we'll get to the point where we think, well, I'm no longer useful, profitable, there's not much I have left to offer, and we'll just begin to kind of retire on the Lord. But the love of God for us is a love that gave us the illustration that He was faithful unto death, even the death of the cross. That if we look to Him and the life that is within us and His love for our life, we too can live and serve for Him until the day that we go to be with the Lord. And that's the way God would have it to be, regardless of our age. I recently read about uh, Truett Cathy. Most of you know the name. He's the man who created and came up with the Chick-fil-A restaurant chain, you know. And a uh, uh, very popular restaurant. He's a Christian man and his testimony is that of faith in Christ as his Savior. And uh, I just recently read where beyond the age of 63, Truett Cathy's business has opened over 1,000 brand new restaurants around the world after the age of 63. That's the age most of us are thinking about shutting her down, isn't it? Quitting, giving up, you know. I've done all I can do. But this man keeps on moving forward in his life. You know, some of the, some of the great work that can still be accomplished for God in our lives can be done by those, maybe even though the outward man is perishing, we can still keep moving forward serving the Lord. We carry not only the aging process in the outward man, but we carry a lot of uh, scars from the different experiences and things that we've gone through in life. And sometimes things in our bodies don't work right because of scar tissue that builds up. They become in, unsensitive or they've stopped working like they should. We can't let the battle scars of life that we've experienced as the outward man has moved through this lifetime trying to live for God to stop us or become desensitized to the things that really need to be accomplished in the remaining part of our lives. We have to let that love that God had for us continue to move us forward. Acts chapter 20, verse 24, the Bible said, But none of these things move me, Paul wrote, speaking about all the experiences that he'd experienced, the shipwrecks, the, 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 uh, the horrible uh, beatings and scourgings, everything that he had endured. He said, None of these things move me, neither count on my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Have you finished the the ministry God has given you to do. I say, Pastor, I didn't even know I had a ministry. You do. You got it the moment you trusted Christ as your Savior. And it is not a, 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 a ministry that we retire from. Uh, you know, I, I get uh, tickled sometimes that people ask me about retirement and these kind of things. I don't have a retirement program. I don't have a 401k. I'm not paying into some kind of group fund. I, 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 and even if I could, I, I, there was a preacher in Newport, a local pastor at a church just like the church I pastored. He came by my office one day, and he's probably about 61 or 2, and he's uh, trying to get me into a pyramid business this deal selling vitamins and I said brother I said how do you have time to do that I said I don't even have time to pass through this church of this little old church I got and have time to go out trying to sell vitamins he said well brother what are you going to do when you retire and I said I don't even think retirement is an option and even if it was I don't want to stop serving God I want to keep on living for Him, don't you? As long as I have breath, whether it's on my feet or on my back, I want to live for the Lord, glorify Him, so I can say like the Apostle Paul, I've finished the course, fought the fight, concluded the ministry that you gave me to do. 
and God's love and grace within our heart and life, it's the power by which we can keep on going on, isn't it? We can overcome these things. God's love is sustaining, enduring strength and power to persevere. You ought to read the life story of Adoniram Judson. He was a missionary to Burma in the 1800s. In the 1800s, there was a war between England and Burma. The problem was Adoniram Judson was in Burma and he was English. That made him immediately an enemy of the state of Burma. Adoniram Judson was taken as a prisoner. He was taken and imprisoned in the notorious Ava death camp. This was a place where People were tortured, they were mistreated, they weren't cared for, they were not fed or watered. If you were placed in that prison and you wanted water, you had to have somebody from the outside bring it to you. If you wanted food, they had to bring it to you. You were put in there to die as an enemy of the state. They weren't going to do anything to sustain your life. Adoniram Judson was a missionary. He was often hung upside down and stayed that way for hours at a time, being tortured. His wife was able to daily bring him little portions of food and water and able to sustain his life. He suffered that way for 17 months in that prison. He was finally released from prison where he faithfully served the Lord and he sought to reach the souls of the Burmese people. Do you know that it took 24 years of teaching and preaching before he saw one convert come to Christ? 24 years of suffering. Watching his life perish outwardly, growing older, carrying the scars of the suffering that he suffered at the hands of the Burmese people that God had sent him to win. He won the first soul after 24 years, and then after 12 more years of preaching and ministering, he only saw 18 total people come to know Christ. But he stands as one of the greatest missionaries who ever served God. His faithfulness. His perseverance, the love of God sustaining His strength and giving His life purpose that He never wavered from. Verse number 16 in 2 Corinthians, it says, For which cause we faint not. We faint not. Why? Because we know the love of God. Because of what God's done for us in love. Because He lives for us in our hearts and lives. Because He's there for us in our life. We faint not. The word faint here, it has the idea to have no purpose or no reason for living. There are people in life, even Christian people I know, who seem like they have no reason for life, no purpose for life. They fainted on the the ministry field of serving God and living for God. The purpose of our lives is... Is, is, is focused upon by the love that God has for us. Because He loved us. Because He sent Himself. Because His Son died for us. Because we're the object of His love. It gives our life purpose. And as He saves us, He's given our lives a, a, a meaning and the opportunity to impact the lives of others. The purpose of our lives is to show that love of God to others who do not yet know Him. We have a purpose. We have, God has a plan. He's shown that love to us. He wants, it, he wants to show it through us to the lives of other people. That's the cause for which we live. And it's the greatest cause in the world. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. We live for something bigger than ourselves. In everything we do, in anything we're doing, there's something bigger than what we're doing. And it's what God has placed us here to do. Our purpose in this world. He talked about the outward man, how the love that God has for us will refresh us, restrain us, keep us moving forward. He talks about the inward man. If you'll notice what he says about the inward man in verse 16, it says uh, he's renewed day by day. Renewed. What a great word. In Romans chapter 12, the Bible says, But I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy Acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not transformed, or be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. 
The same thought, the same truth, this renewing of our minds, being renewed day by day. If there's anything that you could do to turn your life around in 2014, it would be to think biblically about all things. Think biblically about them. Don't let the news influence the way you regard things and look at things. Don't let uh, the stock market reports influence your decisions. Be biblically minded people. And the Word of God, because of the love that God has had in giving it to us, is the source which will renew your lives from the inside out. It's the strength. It, It will feed us and give us what we need. The Word of God. We need to think biblically. If you look in Ephesians 4.23, it says, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. God's word is irreplaceable in our lives. It is for spiritual strength and health and the growth that we need. In 2014, while other churches don't have Sunday school, don't have Sunday night preaching, don't have Wednesday night preaching, in 2014, we need more preaching and teaching and study the God's word, not less. We need more because of the importance of the Word of God in our heart and life. D.L. Moody, founder of Moody Bible Church and Moody Bible Institute, said this, A Bible that is falling apart is testimony of a life that isn't. Let that sink in. That's pretty good, isn't it? Ephesians chapter 3, if you turn there and look in verse 14, Ephesians 3.14 says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. In that passage alone, we see the centrality of the importance of God's love in our lives. It is the bedrock of everything for us and as a church. The love of God, being filled with it, with the knowledge of it, uh, comprehending it, knowing that it is powerful, that its potential is unlimited, and that it never fails. You think about verse 16 there in Ephesians chapter 3, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. With the Word of God... The Spirit of God within us has something to work with. If you don't take the Word of God and feed your life with it, the Spirit that lives within you is left without the resources He uses to strengthen and grow your life in Christ. That's why it's so important. Philippians chapter 4, the 13th verse says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. The person of love is Christ. The power of it is that He lives in us. But think about, thirdly, the proving of this love. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18 there, it says, Things seen and not seen. Things seen and not seen. He's talking about the temporal, those things that are earth and temporary, and the things that are eternal, those things that are forever in the heavens. We can see the temporal and the earthly right now, but we cannot see the eternal and those things that are forever. But he's talking about those two. And he's talking about here uh, seeing them. When we think about our eyesight, One of the things that will cause us not to be able to see right is if the perspective of our eyes is not right. Sometimes people are farsighted and they can't see close up. and Sometimes they're nearsighted and can't see far away. I don't see why those are like that. It should be the other way around, right? 
But anyway, uh, our perspective of things. Uh, maybe your perspective is you're behind something and you can't see around it. You've got yourself behind some things. Your perspective is not right. But he's talking about proving the love of God, proving it out. And it has to do with our seeing things, either focusing on and our perspective being on the things that are seen or the things that are not seen. What we live life for proves what we are in love with. What we live life for proves that either we are in love with the Lord or we are in love with the things of the world. Perspective. Live life with and among. We live life with and among earthly things, but we should live it having a heavenly perspective. Having a heavenly vision. Our, our lives are not our own. We should never forget that. They're Christ. They belong to Him. Trials are momentary. They're momentary. They're, they're endurable because we had the promise of eternity ahead of us. Uh, verse number 17 back there talks about uh, the light afflictions that we go through, which is but for a moment. But they worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You know, we have to put everything into perspective of eternity. And if we'll do that, the love of God can shine forth and have control of our lives. Not only is it this idea of perspective in proving our love, but the idea of our priorities. Because the things we love are the things we're going to give the priority in our life, aren't they? The things which are not seen, these are the things that should be our priorities. In Colossians chapter 3, beginning in the first verse, it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead. Your life is hid with Christ. In 2014, we need to be resolute, steadfast, that in all we do, we do it in the love that God has for us and with the love that we have for Him with our eyes set on heavenly things and our priorities set on the things of God. We ought, to, we ought to, when we worship the Lord, we ought to make it a focus that love is the motive behind what we do. When we worship Him. Genuine. Our love, our love and worship sh- should be genuine. They're not a Sunday morning. We ought not be able to come to church and gather here and with sincerity, because of the love that God has for us, our hearts ought to be able to worship Him. It shouldn't be anything we have to work up. We don't need a praise band. We don't need a worship leader to worship God. The love of God grasping our heart, the knowledge of what He's done for us within our heart, there ought to be nothing that could stop us from worshiping our God anytime, place, with sincerity. Genuine. It's not just going through the motions of something. When, we, when it comes to serving the Lord, serving in the love of God, Serve Him in the love of God. Hebrews eleven twenty eight 28 is a great verse. I bet it's been a long time since you read it or heard it. Verse 11, or chapter 11, verse 28 of the book of Hebrews. Wherefore, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. We serve the Lord this year in 2014 individually as a church. We ought to want our service to be acceptable. And you know, really the only motive, the only acceptable motive for serving Him is loving Him. His love for us. That's the only motive. I want to see souls saved, but I'm not going to try to win souls because I want souls to be saved. I want to win souls because I love the Lord and the Lord loves souls. That's why we win souls, not because we want to see souls saved. We want to serve Him and reach the go- get the gospel out and try to impact lives. And, and, and we're going to talk tonight in our presentation about uh, how love works. You know, there's, we, there's a little play on word there that we can do. Uh, love works. It gets the job done. But if, if, if that's true, then there ought to be some love work involved in there. Not just that it works, but in love working to serve the Lord. And we'll talk about some of those love works.
that we have scheduled in, on our calendar throughout the year. They're just things that no one else may ever feel like they would be important or relevant. But we do them simply because God loves the souls of men. And that because He does, we should love them. And because He loves them in grace and mercy and died for us, not ever expecting anything in return for us, we ought to love the Lord and love to serve others that He loves, not that we ever expect to get anything back in return, but just because God loves them. That's the way it ought to work, isn't it? We'll talk about that. But love works. We ought to worship Him in love, serve Him in love, however and with whatever we can. When we give, whatever it is, time, treasure, talent, we ought to do it because of the love of God. That'll change it. That'll change everything if we love Him that way. Matthew 6, 19, Lay not up yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single... Thy whole body shall be full of light. Pastor, what does that mean? It has the same idea of having that perspective of heaven. It means that we have the single-minded purpose that our life belongs to the Lord. It's His. We're going to live for Him and serve Him. Be faithful to give. Be sincere in your giving in this year. And as, and as we mention, as we witness, as we share the gospel, the Lord said, go, didn't He? Go. Because He loves we should go. Because He lived a sinless life, we ought to live our lives to try to reach those that have not heard. Because He laid down His life and lives again, we ought to be willing to lay down our life in serving others to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to them because of the love of God. We need to work to reach the lost. And the work that we do should be God's love work. That's what it ought to be with the first love, like Eric preached. You remember I said, Eric, you don't know this, but this is going to go right along with what the Lord has for us. The first love. That love that we had when we realized what God had done for us. That love we had for Him. That's what we have to do in 2014. And I can tell you, if, we, if, if we'll let the Lord do it, it, it can't fail. Because love never faileth. Love never faileth. Let's pray together. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Maybe somebody's come to church today. By the way, we thank everybody again for being here. You all have been a blessing and tremendous and listened so well. I'm thankful for you. But maybe you come to church today, but you never ever in your life have ever received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You've never been born again of the Spirit of God. You've never confessed your sin and ask Jesus Christ to cleanse and forgive you of that sin, you've never been saved by Jesus Christ. We want to invite you to Him today. During this invitation, in just a moment, we're going to pray, then we'll stand together. And as we sing, we invite you to step out of your seat and come. And let us take God's Word, show you from the Bible what Jesus Christ has done for you, how you can know Christ as your personal Savior. You've never done that. We invite you to come today. Maybe you're here today and you know the Lord is your Savior. God's spoken to your heart. Maybe He's been speaking to your heart about some specific decision, choice you need to make, direction for your life, whatever it is. I hope you'll come and let Him show you, lead you, and guide you today. Maybe you're here today, God's spoken to your heart. Excited, anticipating the year, the power of the love of God, the person of the love that lives within you, proving the love of God for your life. Right now, uh, maybe you just need to come as an individual or as a family and just gather here and pray and say, Lord, this year we want your love to work through our lives so it can impact the world in which we live. Through our church, maybe you need to come today. Some are coming. Others of you may need to slip out and come. Why don't you come today and let's pray. Let's give this to the Lord. Ask Him to lead and guide us as we move forward this year knowing that love works, the love of God works. And that's what we want to go forth with as we serve God and live for Him this year is the love of God. Maybe others need to come. We're going to pray. Father, we thank You in Jesus' name now that, God, You've allowed us to meet together this morning. Thank You for the presence of the Holy Spirit, for the Word of God, its truth. Well, we pray You'll speak to each of our hearts and lives. 
We ask, dear Lord Jesus, today that, God, you would just, uh, Lord, again, just uh, take these truths, this, this thought, this central foundational principle of your love, how it's unfailing, how there's no law that can stand against it or overrule it. And, Lord, help us to realize that, God, you've given us everything we need to see souls saved, to see lives changed, to see growth in our church, in our lives, our home, our family, everything we need has been given to us. And it's in you. It's you living in us. You living through us. Your love, God, constraining and guiding us. And Lord, we pray this coming year that God will help to prove that love works. And Lord, we just ask now that God, you'd have your way in our hearts and lives. As a church, as individuals, as families, Lord, we pray for the folks who come today that, God, you'll just minister to them as they turn these things over to you and seek your leadership and guidance to trust you and know that, God, your love will not fail them, that, God, you're as good as your word, your promises are steadfast, your presence is in them, you never leave nor forsake them. And, God, I pray today that, Father, uh, you'll just minister to their heart. Lord, we just ask you now again now that you'll bless your work. Uh, Lord, help each of us now. Uh, if someone is, uh, is sitting in their seat even now that needs to come to, Lord, allow you to do your work in their life, that, Lord, they'll be obedient. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand together. Take a hymn book. Turn to hymn number 310 in your hymn book. Hey, Evan, why don't you come and just pray with this lady. Hymn 310. And uh, let's see that first verse. If the Lord spoken to your heart and you didn't slip out of your seat and come, why don't you do that? But let's sing it together. Hymn number 310, that first verse. Sing the third verse, verse 3. It's been a good morning, and uh, we are just excited about uh, this year, excited about this theme that pastors share with us, and uh, we've been looking forward to this day. Hope you'll uh, go home tonight, think about uh, the message from God's Word, get rested, and then be back tonight so we can uh, hear the conclusion of all these things. And so we're uh, just uh, excited about today. I uh, hope you'll uh, just continue to let God work in your heart and your life. Uh, from these truths we've heard from God's Word. But we'll finish here this morning with a word of prayer. Brother Doug, you care to pray for us? Thank you. Yes. Amen. Amen.